Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today to take a detailed look at the image quality from the new Zeiss Batiste 135mm. This is the APO Sonar, and of course it is a 135mm f2.8 lens. And is the newest lens from Zeiss for its Batiste line, and that's specifically for Sony E-mount bodies. Now, of course, this is uh, comes in at the, the highest price point for any of the Batiste series, and thus it comes under some extra scrutiny when it comes to the overall image quality. And so today we're going to take a look at it and see if this lens justifies its $2,000 price point in the United States. So let's look at a variety of different things and see what conclusions we come up to. Okay, we're going to start by doing some comparison between the uh, Batiste here on the left side, and then we'll look at both the uh, new Tamron 70 to 200 G2, um, along with the uh, the Canon 70 to 200 L Mark II. So the first thing I want to point out is that if we look towards the corner, there is a massive, massive difference in the amount of vignette that is present. And uh, this is actually a really exceptional thing for a Zeiss lens because that, in my experience, has been kind of the, the one optical weak link is that they often have fairly pronounced vignette. But I noted that this is spectacular. And when I looked at the chart that I had uh, that came from, um, from Zeiss and then I compared it to that of the Milvis 2135, I found that uh, with this Batiste lens, there's only a 10% difference in the illumination here in the extreme corners um, between f2.8 wide open and f5.6 compared to on the the Milvis, it's a 60% difference. And so it shows just how much uh, vignette is present and then clears up as you stop the lens down. But there is virtually no... Um, no real vignette here to worry about, whereas on the Tamron here, of course, it's fairly heavily pronounced. Another thing to notice here as we're looking is that, of course, here in the extreme edges of the uh, of the image, you can see that there's definitely a, a notable advantage in the overall uh, resolution here for the um, Batiste lens, and so its sharpness really extends right out to the edges of the frame in a fairly exceptional fashion. If we look here towards the center of the frame, we see that here at the, in the middle that the Batiste actually lags a little bit behind the, uh, the Tamron, which is very, very sharp here at this point. And uh, if we look towards this part of the frame, we're going to find that they are uh, roughly about similar, um, maybe just a hair more contrast here for the Batiste, both of them delivering a pretty beautiful result there. So if we take it out to an infinity kind of comparison here, I've got the Batiste on the left and I've got the Canon here on the right. And so you can see once again the extreme difference in vignette here in the corners. Um, if we look towards the center of the frame um, in this area here, I'm not seeing a big advantage for either lens. As we start to move out towards the edges of the frame, however, it becomes very extremely noticeable that the Batiste is far crisper um, in terms of its texture rendering. So what we're seeing is a pattern where the Batiste has really even sharpness across the frame that is exceptional out on the edges and uh, good in the good in the center of course it's you know even better in the center but by comparison the other lenses are more optimized towards the center of the frame whereas the Batiste is develop, uh, just delivering a really even performance all the way across the frame now if you take the Batiste into the studio it delivers of course as you would expect exceptional results the uh, sensor on the Sony a7R2 that I'm shooting on really is fantastic and so the amount of resolution and detail here is just mind-boggling this is at f5.6 to keep a little bit more in focus remember 135 millimeters is going to produce a pretty shallow depth of field and so if you want to get both eyes in focus as I've done here you do need to stop down a little bit but as you can see in terms of overall skin textures it is just incredible the amount of detail that is present there and of course overall the global look is nice here's another a portrait example here and if you take a look at wow at the eyelashes there and this is at f2.8 here but look at the stunning amount of detail that is rendered there in those eyelashes great rendering of skin tones and then of course a very beautiful fall off it just looks really really nice overall another situation that i find often very challenging for lenses is not just shooting at kind of close to medium distances but how do they hold up 
at wide open when shot towards infinity. This is focused all the way out here towards the end of this corridor of trees, but as you can see, it has not lost contrast. It's not, there's no haze that has crept into this, but rather that's a very, very crisp result all the way out towards infinity. That really is one of the things to me that sets apart exceptional optics from ordinary ones. Now to just take a quick look at aperture um, here as we stop down, and so here's at f2.8, and so as you can see, um, really none of the bokeh circles are completely circular here. That's not really a, an amazing result overall. In terms of busyness, I mean, it's, it's not, I, the Milvis 85mm has the most smooth bokeh circles I've seen from a Zeiss lens, um, but this is not a, obviously not a terrible performance. There is a fairly defined inner line here that I'm not always crazy to see, and of course, this may be a big deal to you if you really um, are concerned about kind of the cat eye effect, but in all honesty, there really aren't too many lenses, telephoto length lenses or medium telephotos that don't exhibit this phenomena here. Stopping down to f4, um, you can see the shape of the aperture blades uh, starting to show up there. So beginning on that nonagonal shape, and uh, but you know neither have we gotten perfect circles along the edge. Down to f5.6, now we have more consistently circular, although they're really nonagonal shapes um, across the frame overall. Stopping on down to f8, now you have, of course, very uh, clear nonagonal shapes here, and, uh, you know, the beginnings of heading towards creating, you know, sunburst, and so some of that, you know, light bleed that's starting to take effect. That's not really a negative thing, it's just the, the shape of the aperture blades at this point. Of course, if you actually look at the detail on the subject here, it's just stunning. It looks like a macro lens in terms of the amount of detail that is rendered there. Very impressive. Now, how does that bokeh look out in the real world? You know, I've seen nothing that I am really, uh, that I would consider any kind of cause con for, for concern. Obviously, there's really great sharpness on our subject, but if you look towards this, and these are just dead branches at this point. You know, very challenging uh, rendering subjects, but I think that the there's no funky lines that I'm seeing. Overall, it looks pretty nice here. Of course, once again here, you know, there's leaves that are just a few feet away. They're rendered nice and soft. And of course, you know, when you look at the plane of focus, exceptional, exceptional detail rendered there. Really, that is a, that's a beautiful result. Here's another real world result. And, uh, and so once again, if we look at our plane of focus, very sharp definition there. But of course, beautifully of uh, soft defocused background there as well. Now, in terms of color, of course, Zeiss color is always pretty special. So this is just available light here, but as you can see, the uh, color rendition is just gorgeous. Detail, bokeh fall off, all of it looks really, really nice. Uh, here's another example um, that I just thought, you know, what came out of a very simple scene had a, a really beautiful result due to nice rendering, nice color rendition, and then, of course, you know, what matters, where it is that sharpness where it matters too. And so, you know, optically, there's, there's just nothing really to complain about there. So this just gives you a look at maximum magnification here. And so I've, I'm at minimum focus, and this is a little tiny old vintage lens. And so you can see it's magnified quite well, a 0.19 times, which is useful, but not as good as a 0.25 times of the Milvis lens. Now, at this distance, of course, depth of field is really shallow, and so on our plane of focus, you know, great sharpness, but you really could use this lens, and on the, you know, the high megapixel count of the A7R2, you really could use it as a macro-ish lens if you would stop it down, if you just really wanted to get the detail of something you were rendering. Now, a quick look at flare resistance. This is something that's often a weakness for telephoto lenses. And so obviously there is some prismatic haze. This is at f2.8. No real uh, ghosting effects that I'm seeing. And, and I think that most people are going to find an artistic value for that. You know, the, the Canon 135L in this situation basically just washes out the whole frame. And so this is obviously a much nicer result. And if we look outside of the epicenter of the flare, we've got really nice contrast, you know, nothing has really been lost there, and of course, great, great detail. And so then if we stop it down to an extreme around F11, we see that um, we've lost a lot of the prismatic haze, and the only real ghosting that I'm seeing is right in this area here. And once again, it's happening in a fairly artistic fashion, and so um, the, the pattern there, I think, will be useful to 
um, perhaps portrait photographers are those that are actually going to be backlighting. And of course, a nice you know sunburst effect there. So overall, I think that for a, a medium telephoto, this is actually a pretty good uh, performance um, when you put the sun or put the sun right in the, the center of the frame. So as you can see, this is a very serious optical performer and uh, it lacks nothing in comparison to a lot of lenses that I've tested. And in fact, it, it even manages to avoid the typical Zeiss flaw and that is um, vignette, which vignette is almost perfectly controlled really for a telephoto lens, even from wide open. As we saw, image quality is very, very good. Amazing sharpness and resolution. Portrait links are, it's a stunning combination between this lens and the Sony a7R II body that I'm doing this test on. Just incredible amount of detail and really there's, there's no lack of detail. You could shoot it perfectly wide open, but in a studio type setting, you'll probably want to stop down a little bit just and so you have enough features and focus. 135 millimeters is a very shallow depth of field, even if you're shooting at f2.8. Which brings us to kind of what may be the chief criticism for people outside of the overall price, and that is that this has a you know somewhat pedestrian maximum aperture of f2.8 as opposed to a wider aperture of f2, like their Milvis 135mm f2 lens. I think that what Zeiss has chosen to do is they have decided that for the sense, the sense of weight and balance on the mirrorless bodies that it's designed for, they have dis decided to basically produce an almost perfectly optimized 135 millimeter f2.8 lens rather than saddling this lens with a larger aperture and um, you know creating an imbalance on the bodies it's designed for. Not everybody's going to agree with that decision, but I think that that in part is what has produced such low vignette. Of course, it has great flare resistance for a medium telephoto as we saw, no chromatic aberrations that are present, vignette is well controlled, distortion is basically non-existent, and then of course we saw beautiful real world rendering bokeh along with just incredible sharpness in every kind of situation from portrait length to medium distance even out to infinity. All told, I think that there is probably nobody that's really going to be disappointed with this lens optically. And, and so I think that Zeiss has done a great job once again in designing a really beautiful optical machine here and, and it looks fantastic. Really the only uh, criticism, I think if there's any criticism I could offer is that having uh, reviewed both of Zeiss's 135mm f2 lenses that I, I think that they may have a slightly more special rendering, if I could use that term, that comes in large part due to that greater more, and more shallow depth of field. And, and that you know resulting kind of three-dimensional pop that comes as a part of that. But overall, I think that this lens is, they probably made the right choice in just making a perfectly optimized f2.8 lens that is really going to provide a shallow enough depth of field for just about everybody in just about every situation. I'm Dustin Abbott, and if you look in the description below, you can see my uh, link to my image gallery that I've been adding to. My time is almost up with this lens, and so I will be following up up in just a, a few days with my, my final review and verdict on it, give you a little more info on autofocus and handling and all of those, those basic things um, in my summation. If you haven't already clicked that subscribe button, please do so. Thanks for watching today. Have a great day.